well, thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, I'm gonna read. I want to read a little bit from my book, and then I'm gonna show. Uh, um, I'm gonna show some slides and discuss them. And when I show the slides and discuss them, I'm gonna. I realize I'm gonna need someone to hit the button, the forward button. Um, so I need nearby, nearby volunteer to handle that for me. I don't need much of an introduction right now because I'm gonna read first off right from the beginning of the book. Um, just a couple pages, and then, then I'm gonna write a sign and show some images and talk about that. This begins with a quote from a guy who, uh, a novelist named Padgett Powell, and I'm sure he has no idea he said this, but he, but he said this one time in passing. He said, they have the huge rump-like hump, the giant head, the eyeball the size of a billiard ball. What is not to like? In the past week, I've become something of a buffalo chip connoisseur. The perfect specimen has a circumference of a baseball cap with folded layers like a sheep's turban. It's as dense as a ginger snap cookie with the color and texture of old cardboard that's been wet and dried out again. Of course, when I say buffalo chip, I'm talking about buffalo dung or what's left of vegetation after it passes through the digestive circuitry of North America's largest native land mammal, also known as the American bison. These chips will burn with an orange colored halo of flame surrounding a coal black center. They let off a good heat, not many sparks, and a blue hued smoke that smells nothing like you'd expect it to. At times I've dipped my face into the smoke and picked up the odors of cinnamon and cloves, dried straw and pumpkins, and sometimes the smell of walking into a bathroom after someone smoked a joint. If I were to leave my buffalo chip fire right now, it would take me about a half hour to stomp my way through the thickets of spruce and alder that separate me from the Chetislina River, a fast flowing torrent of glacial runoff that drains a collection of 14,000 foot peaks in the Wrangell Mountains of South Central Alaska. If I tossed a stick into the Chetislina, it would drift through three miles of canyon before dumping into the cold gray swirl of the much larger Copper River. From there, the stick would flow more or less southward past a couple of small villages and dozens of fish traps that were recently dragged onto the banks by their owners to save them from the crushing flows of winter ice. After dodging past mountains and winding through canyons, the stick would enter the Gulf of Alaska outside of Prince William Sound. As the crow flies, or is more likely in these parts the raven, that's about 80 miles from here. Along the way, the crow would cross one two-lane highway, and any number of wolves, coyotes, lynx, black bears, grizzlies, wolverines, mountain goats, doll sheep, and moose, and perhaps a herd or two of wandering buffalo. Earlier in the morning, there were about 20 of them in this valley. One of them, a cow or female, is now lying just uphill from me within arm's reach, probably about 600 pounds of hide, bone, horn, and innards, another 400 or 500 pounds of meat. When it fell dead, after I shot it, it slid down the steep slope across the wet slush and crashed into a snag of aspen trees. I've been working on it all day. I made skinning cuts up the legs and then opened the carcass from the underside of the tail to the chin before removing the entrails. With short, fast slices from my skinning knife, I pulled the hide away from the upper half of the carcass as if I were slowly turning down the covers of a bed. I skinned over the brisket, ribs, and paunch, then up and over the shoulder all the way to the animal's spine. If you touch the base of your own neck and feel the pebble-like shapes running up the center of your backbone, you're feeling the neural processes of your thoracic vertebra. On a buffalo, those things can be 20 inches long. They act as a sort of mooring post for tendons that support the animal's shag-haired, curved-horned head. The hump gives the buffalo its distinctive look, its front-heavy, bulldozer, mass-shouldered appearance. I've been rationing my food for the last few days, and now I can eat all I want. I cut some slices of fat from behind the hump and then pull the hide back in place to keep the carcass from freezing too solid to work on. The fat has an orangish color, not like the white fat you see on grain fat and beef. The orange is from a diet of wild plants that are rich in fat-soluble carotene, the same substance that colors a carrot. The heat of the fire liquefies the fat and leaves the cracklings floating in the oil of my pan like if you melted hard candy and all the wrappers came to the surface. Whenever a crackling becomes rendered out, I pinch it out with the pliers on my leather man and blow on it until it's cooled and crispy. I was keeping my salt in the film canister sealed with duct tape, but sometime over the last week, when I was crossing a river or standing in the rain or snow, the salt got wet. I scrape the chunk out with my knife and then grind it back into grains between my fingers. With a bit of salt, the cracklings taste like pork rinds, but much better. They taste wilder. 
so begins the story. And the book primary, when I was writing the book, I thought of it having kind of um, two primary threads. The first thread was about time I spent hunting for this herd in Alaska. And you'll see on this, this image up here that where what I was just reading occurred happens kind of right where the fog, where you can see the fog come down to the clear area on the left-hand side of the river. Um, it's a peculiar story how these animals wound up being in the Wrangell Mountains, and, and in a way it encap encapsulates the entire history of the, the species. It's hard to guess how many of these animals were ever around, but the fashionable guess these days um, is that there were maybe about 36 million or so, 32 million at the time of European contact. That number is down from 60 million, and people think that there's some kind of like political reasoning for why it's less, like it won't seem as bad what we did. But the 60 million figure that was the go-to number for almost 100 years was based on this observation by this guy named Colonel Dodge, who Dodge City is named after. And one day he was out uh, traveling on the Arkansas River in Kansas, and he started counting a herd of buffalo that went by. And it took a couple of days from the past, and he heard from some friends who were some miles away that they saw the same thing. And he also figured that they were probably traveling in a wedge shape as they're prone to do. And so he made this calculation that he must have been looking at four million of them. Um, then he looked at a map and thought, well, if there's four million here, there's probably, fifth, or there's probably um, 15 of these little areas spread around North America and 60 million buffalo. Um, now the number is about 32 million on the Great Plains, and it's based on carrying capacity, like how much land at the time when people were bringing cattle and sheep, how many were hanging around. By the end of the Civil War, that number was down to 15 million. Um, and then between 1872 and 1882, that final 15 million was reduced down to maybe less than 1,000, um, about 75 in the United States of America. People recognized this as a problem almost too late. It was kind of through good luck that the animal was saved, but it was saved largely through eccentrics like ranchers who thought it would be cool to have some, and they also figured that if there weren't any around and they did have one, it would be extremely valuable. They were like big, they subscribed to law, uh, supply and demand laws. And once people decided to start saving them, they, they started these captive breeding programs. And one of the most important ones like, was in, in Moes, Montana, at the National Bison Range, just north of Missoula, Montana. And people just saw all they're trying to do is what they save them from what, what people now refer to as genetic extinction. They just didn't want them to go away. And so they started breeding them at the National Bison Range, and pretty soon um, they had a couple thousand of them. And then everybody declared that the problem was solved, there's nothing more to do, and so they started slaughtering the excess and selling the pemmican in Canada. Uh, it made some people uneasy to see this going on after the, the government sanctioned slaughter that happened before that. So these guys in, in Alaska, some hunters in Fairbanks thought it'd be cool to hunt some around here, and they thought that there wasn't enough game animals in Alaska. So they inquired with the National Bison Range if they could have some, and the National Bison Range said you can have 17 if you pay for shipping. So it, from Missoula, Montana, they took them in a wagon and put them on a train, and then shipped them by rail to Seattle, then shipped those 17 by barge to Whittier, put them on a train in Whittier and shipped them to Fairbanks, put them on a truck in Fairbanks and shipped them to Delta Junction. They all lived, which is better because that, uh, over the years, the National Bison Range shipped 4,000 just to Wainwright, Alberta, and they lost um, 2,000 in transit. They usually lost 50% 50, 50 in transit. Um, no one knows why these ones made it. They made it up here in 1920, and then they hung around for a while until they started becoming very inconvenient to farmers who were coming into the Delta Junction area and also the military presence. So they put some on a C-130 cargo ship and, and, and dumped those in, near Chitna. They put some on a truck one day and took them on the Nebesna Road and, and let them go. And this was before statehood, so it was carried out by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And they did something that they call a hot release, where you just pull up, open the door, everybody runs out, and then you see what happens. And, and now sort of the more standard idea is the cold release, where one day you just leave the door open and they kind of hang around. So from 1950 to 1960, no one really knew where the animals were. There's rumors that they had been killed off by wolves or bears or died of disease. Now and then someone would notice one. Bush pilots would report seeing them in strange places like walking down the road near Toke. Or, um, and after about 10 years, some people realized that they had showed up in the area of the Dadina, Nadina, Chetislinga rivers. And they were, had reproduced to a point where there was between 100 and 200 of them. 